Hello. <laughs> Hello, it's Ruthie. Welcome to my channel if you're new here or welcome back if you've been here. And I thank you so much for coming back and for your patience and for waiting for me to post videos and then watching them when they're posted and then liking them sometimes and maybe even commenting sometimes. Thank you. I see you and I love you. So, <laughs> for this video today, I have a fun idea. <laughs> if you do happen to be new to my channel, if this is the first video you are viewing of me, hello. Thank you for viewing. Normally, I would say you should go back and watch some of my past videos, which you still should go and do, but this video is going to be featuring my first YouTube talking video I ever made. I was 24 in the video that we'll be looking at and I am now 27. And I feel like those are good ages. Like 24 is like, it was kind of like a milestone year for me. 27 is shaping up to be the same. And I feel like that's like 30 is probably gonna be two, 33, 36, you know, just keep going. I feel like those will all be good kind of like checkpoints to be like, how are we doing, Ruth? How are, how are we now as opposed to three years ago? So this video will be the first reaction of hopefully a long series on this channel of reacting to myself three years later. I'm going to be doing my makeup pretty lightly. I don't know if you can see it really too well, but I have a little patch of psoriasis that's basically always on my eyelid. So I tend to do like pinky red looks anyway because it kind of disguises it. So I will be using this palette today. It is the Bad Side Zodiac Melt Cosmetics thing, the fire signs. I am a Leo and I just love the concept of this. It's just so funny. It says, for the main character you think you are. And I say, for the main character, I know I am. So, that's gonna be fun. So I actually did start this channel five years ago, but I first, for the first two years I was posting on YouTube, it was only yoga classes for the most part. I don't think there was really anything else I did, but I've been wanting to make talking videos for like my whole life. And I finally got the courage to do it three years ago, um, which is just really, strange it was only three years ago i mean you will see in this video i've changed a lot um my skin was really bad at this time as well so just a heads up about that <laughs> i remember that being one of the final hurdles to overcome because i'd been making excuses for years and years i'm like no i don't i'm not gonna do it i'm not gonna record today no 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 not today not today and then i was like well i can't record today because i'm breaking out and i was like girl you're, my skin was just in a really bad phase. I'm like, you're always gonna have a pimple. So just record and that can't be an excuse. So I'm very proud of this 24 year old Ruthie just for having the courage to put this video out there. I've always wanted to make talking videos on YouTube just because I like to talk a lot and I've watched YouTube. So I was like, oh, I wanna do that. Um, but when I had my first surgery in 2014, at the end of 2014, I, watched a ton of YouTube videos about people talking about their life with an ostomy bag, with getting their colon removed, with living with a J pouch, just that whole journey. And I found some very helpful videos and I really wanted to contribute to the other side of it uh, once I had my surgeries done. So 24 year old Ruthie will explain a lot and I'm going to do my makeup. All right, here we go. Hey guys, so I wanted to make a video like this for quite some time. I finally stopped making excuses and here I am. So my name is Ruthie. I'm guessing if you're watching this video, you're finding it from um, researching ulcerative colitis, J pouch, ostomy bags. So I wanted to give my health history of what's happened thus far in my life as far as my ulcerative colitis journey, um, living with an ostomy bag, and now living with a J pouch, and just kind of how that's affected my mental health and um, just ways I've been coping. And yeah, so I'm just going to get right into it. 
I'm not going to go into she... detail, like explaining the terms. Like, I'm just going to assume that you know what ulcerative colitis is, what an ostomy bag is, what a JPAT. I'm just going to assume you know all that stuff. And then in the future, if I find people are watching this who don't really know or are curious, then I'll make videos explaining that stuff. So to start, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when I was 15. I kind of always had a sensitive stomach. So uh, I was like lactose intolerant in kindergarten. I got diagnosed with that. So, and I always just found myself in the nurse's office, like me and the nurses, school nurses, best friends, always. Um, I could kind of just go there whenever I needed to. And, you know, as a, as a girl, especially as a young girl, bathroom problems are a nightmare. I would straight up have like, have nightmares about like farting in class or someone walking in on me when I'm pooping or like just, like you name it just anything that involving someone finding out that I fart and then I poop like oh my god like oh my god <laughs> so yeah I still have nightmares like that I don't know if they'll ever go away entirely because I know many people with these issues are the same way so I guess just for a little context of where I was in my life at this the point of recording this, I was living in the last apartment I ever lived in in Brooklyn at this time. And I was living with my boyfriend at the time. I could sense the end of my relationship was near. <laughs> and I knew that I wasn't happy living in New York. I knew I was getting sicker. I knew I, I just felt completely and entirely lost at this time that I recorded this. And I didn't really know what else to do besides the things that I always wanted to do. Oh, yeah. And it was also the beginning of COVID, I'm pretty sure. So I had just had surgery. I had surgery three days before New York City shut down um, from COVID. So I was recovering from surgery. I was in a bad relationship living with him. And so we were like basically roommates at the time. And... I could feel that things were changing a lot and I could sense that the end of life as I knew it was near, if not there. And um, as I said, recording YouTube videos, like me talking to the camera has been something I've wanted to do for a very, very long time. And this was kind of my way of separating myself from the relationship I was in. It was like my way of like, I have things that I want to do. I'm doing my own things. Like this is something I've always wanted to do. And like, I'm recording today. Like I'm doing this, I'm writing a script today. Da, 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 da. And it was really helpful for me to kind of create that separation. Cause I was in that relationship for three years. So I remember recording YouTube videos and posting and doing my yoga classes, my Patreon, all the things I was doing at that time was kind of my way of distracting myself as well as like setting myself up for a life that is separate from him, a life that is like just my own, like this is my thing, you know, because we shared, we shared a lot. We shared like friends, we shared a apartment. Our lives were just really like melded together. So yeah, I just wanted to say that context, I guess. So you have a better idea of like where I was at at this time, why my skin is so bad <laughs> and why I look the way I do because I get real bad stress acne. So that's what that was. Um, and I was also like dying because I just had surgery and like, you'll see. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. I always kind of felt in my head, I'm like, I mean, I, I see this with other people. Like sometimes your biggest fears or the things you want to avoid the most, like just have a way of just coming into your life and forcing you to deal with them. And that's, that definitely happened with me. I don't know whether that's like just a coincidence or not, but that's what happened. So when I was 15, I just remember I was always, I've always been an athlete and I was, there was a big volleyball game coming up and it was like against our rival team. Like hours before the game, I couldn't get off the toilet. I, I just couldn't. Like anytime I would stand up, I just had to run right back. Like I just felt like I was going to shit myself. And then once I got onto the toilet, I couldn't shit. And then just blood started coming out. And that, I remember that had been happening for like a few months. And I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell my mom. I didn't tell friends. I, I was just like my secret because um, I just figured it would go away. Like I just thought I had like a stomach bug or something like 
And it's embarrassing. The other thing I want to, <laughs> not crazy. The other thing I want to add to that bit is uh, just emphasize really the, how I've not always been comfortable talking about poop and farting and poopy stuff. And honestly, I'm still not entirely. Um, but it's something that I uh, have been quite literally forced to have to confront and deal with. Um, and so I say that to say, if you are maybe a young girl right now and are in that kind of mindset of just like, maybe something has been happening with your health for a few months and you haven't told anyone and you're just kind of like hoping it goes away, looking for, uh, other like people on YouTube who maybe have the same things. It is totally okay to be in that phase. Um, I think it's very, a very natural response, but please tell someone, <laughs> tell your parents, tell your doctor, tell your school nurse, tell someone who you feel safe with. Um, and if you don't have anyone who you feel safe with, go to like an urgent care maybe, or find someone that you can tell that you've been having these issues with, someone you feel comfortable with, a best friend, maybe they can, their parents, I don't know. There's gotta be someone who you can reach out to or me you can freaking send me an email if you want. And I will do my best to like, look in your area and like match you up with a gastroenterologist who's near you like something like i have a deep need <laughs> to help people like my past self because that it sucked and i'm very 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 lucky and very grateful i have an amazing amazing family my parents have been with me through every step of the way and i know that there are people out there who don't have that support system around them and i cannot imagine dealing with these issues i've had to deal with without that support system. So I, I need to help in any way that I can. So yeah, just throwing that out there. Let's keep listening. And it's embarrassing. I don't like talking about it. So I was shitting blood. I finally told my mom because she was like, why, why are you in the bathroom so much? And um, she was like, we have to go to the hospital right now. So I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, no, I can't. I'm going to miss the game. I'm like crying because I'm just like, they're never going to put me on the team now. Like I'm unreliable, like all that shit. So go to the hospital and get diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. And I remember that day, the gastro told me about the J pouch surgery and about, um, having an ostomy bag. And as soon as he said it, I was like, Nope, I'm never having that done. Never. I'm never going to have that done. And I think I felt so strongly about it because there was a pretty, a uh, solid voice in my head saying, you're going to have to have that done. You're going to have a shit bag. You're going to have it. And everything in my body was like, no, no, I'm not like liar. And I like fight with myself a lot. So still, do. um, yeah, that was when I first heard of an ostomy surgery and like having the shit bag and all that. I, d I just like to refer to it as a shit bag because it's funny sounding. So, um, and that's what it is. Let's be real. You shit into a bag. Um, so from 15 to 18, I tried everything under the sun to get my colitis under control. I was on Lialda. I was on Symphony, um, prednisone for flare ups, Remicade, which was the worst. I got like weird skin tags. That like infusion you go once a month to the hospital for. Um, methotrexate, I was on uh, more recently, actually. And then um, Humira, I tried. So all of those, I've just, I've always, I, I don't want to feel like so fragile. And these medications being so heavy duty and requiring so much of you, like a shot you give yourself once a week or once a month that has to be refrigerated, like travel restrictions and or the infusion, you have to go to a hospital once a month. Like that's a lot. And to think, and I'm young. So thinking about doing that for the rest of my life, I'm like, I just don't want to do this. Like I want to do whatever I can to not be on any medications. So I tried getting off medications so many times and just tried to focus on eating right eating or listening to my body and not eating the things that are going to fuck me up i have such a sensitive stomach there's so many dietary restrictions i have that i'll go into at some point i just felt like if i made it my job like my full-time job to focus on being healthy then i could do it i feel like the medications 
um, are like, if I don't want to make any lifestyle changes and I'm like, well, I think I have to accept that this is going to be my life. And I just want to make the lifestyle changes that I need to make. And obviously like the more time that goes by, the more I like question this way of thinking, because it's just so fucking exhausting to always have to be thinking about or worrying that I, if I eat the wrong thing, I could be in the hospital tonight, you know? So that is scary to me. And like right now I'm not on anything. I'm not, don't take any medications, but I will get into that. I'm going to, this is going to be super rambly. Full warning. I ramble quite a bit, go off on tangents, but this is the way I think. And this is kind of my process. So fun fact, that was the seed of me calling the playlist Ruthie Rambles was when I was editing that. I was like, oh, I can just do Ruthie Rambles. Or I remember I couldn't decide if I wanted to do like ramble on Ruthie, like that Grateful Dead song, like ramble on baby. But I landed on Ruthie Rambles, which I like. I hope you stay with me on this uh, for as long as you can bear. So I started modeling when I was 15 as well. And I know there was a part of me that noticed the convenience of oh, I need to be skinny for modeling and I can't eat because so, this stuff makes my stomach hurt. So I love how I said this stuff makes my stomach hurt. Stuff meaning food, all food. <laughs> I just think that there was like a correlation there. And I think that maybe my subconscious accelerated the extent of my disease um, because of the stress and body image issues from the modeling industry. So I will go a lot more into that at some point in the future. But for now, I'm going to leave it at that. And then when I was 18, right after high school, like a month after I graduated, I moved to New York. I moved into the dorms at FIT. I was signed with this big agency. And I was just trying to live my life to the fullest. And I was. I was going out partying. I was going to castings. I was going to school. I was just doing the absolute most. And all my spare time was spent on the toilet. All of it. Um, all of it. I couldn't eat much. I was basically eating just white rice. That was basically all I could tolerate. And I was wasting away. I just remember I was living at the dorms at FIT. So on uh, 27th and 7th in Manhattan. And uh, my friend Lionel, shout out if you ever happen to see this. <laughs> um, probably not. But he uh, gave me a scooter, like one of those like standing kick scooters, like a beefed up razor scooter. And I would just pop, like roll out of bed, stand on the scooter and just pedal down like three blocks to that Whole Foods that's right over there and get uh, get a thing of the white rice that's like already made there and then roll back and that's and just eat that and that's literally all i could eat i was i think I, I put pictures in here but i was a skeleton my mom came to visit me and was just like concerned because i'm 5'11 and i was around 110 pounds at the time um it was right before midterms the first semester i ended up getting super sick couldn't leave my dorm room, couldn't, couldn't take care of myself at all. I was spending basically all of the time on the toilet. My mom came and picked me up. She took me back home and brought me to Mass General in Boston. And I ended up staying there for a month. Um, I just remember it was like right before Halloween that I left. So I like still had all these plans. I'm like, no, I'm going to go to this party for Halloween. Like, no, I'm going to do this. And life was just like, no, you're not. You're going to be in a hospital bed for the foreseeable future. I was in a lot of pain. I was incredibly uncomfortable. I didn't, I, I had just no hope. Like I didn't feel like I was gonna get better. I felt like everything was downhill from that point going forward. And I wasn't that wrong, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I just remember I stepped onto the scale and I was 100 pounds or I think I, I think it's a 99 pounds at 511 so I'll put a picture up somewhere but I was a straight up skeleton uh people I just remember people looking at me and like the way they looked at me was like scared and concerned and I was confused I just remember googling 
what a healthy weight is for someone who's 5'11 and it was like 150 160 and I was like that's fat like am I, I was like I wouldn't I could never be that heavy like my body image was so fucked up I talk about it more in uh later in this video but more so in other videos that I'm going to do reactions to as well when I talk about um growing up modeling and I remember the first time that I realized other people see me as skinny was when I walked into a five below and there was this little kid who just pointed at me and goes, tall and skinny. <laughs> and I just remember being like, oh my God, he thinks I'm skinny. <laughs> like, it was so bad, dude. It was so bad. Um, yeah, I'm going to do a reaction video and talk more about you know, body image with social media and modeling, but it is dark. They totally just, you know, I was, I was told I was pear shaped when I was 15. Um, and so from that, and I was always told like, you just got to trim up on your hips. You just got to trim up on your hips. So it didn't matter what I looked like. It literally didn't matter. Didn't matter what anyone said about how I looked besides my agents and the people who were booking me. Um, or I just, I just didn't believe anyone when they said I was skinny. Like, I was just like, you're just saying that. Like, you're just trying to be nice. So messed up. I'm so happy I'm in a good place <laughs> with my mind and body image and perception at this point in my life. And I was more so at that point. I was definitely a lot better at this point when I was 24 as well. Um, way more so than when I was like 15 through 22. Um, but I've still, I've grown a lot since this time as well. And I feel like I had a lot of fake confidence at this time, or I was doing like a fake it till you make it approach with confidence, um, which can work sometimes, but it's way better when it's the real thing. I remember looking down at my thighs and just squeezing the edges of my thighs and being like, that's extra. Like all of that is extra. I don't need any of that. And that's, that's what the modeling industry really did to me. Um, there's always someone skinnier than you. I was called pear-shaped when I was 15 and that stuck with me. So in my mind, my hips and my thighs were huge and they were always going to be huge. And no matter what people said, no matter how I looked, and that's why I took a lot of pictures or a few pictures during that time because I was like, I know I'm skinny, but I don't see it. Like I really don't see it. And it was so strange because I always kind of prided myself on having a strong mind and a strong like view on who I am. And this was just kind of proof that that's wrong. And I still had trouble accepting it. Um, and I know I'm not alone there. I know there's way too many young women dealing with body image issues like that. And young men. I did not say it in this, but I'm becoming more and more aware of a lot of the issues that young girls face, young boys face as well, just their own version of it, you know. Anyway, so uh, they told me I was going to have to have my colon taken out. Um, all of this is super blurry. This happened when I was 18 years old. I'm now 24. And um, I was on a lot of painkillers. That damn psoriasis. You see how scaly that gets? Oh, well. It was watching a lot of tv watching a lot of youtube and you know just hanging out with friends family who are coming to visit like watching videos on having um an ostomy bag because i was like i'm gonna have to have this so i gotta study because this is a lot of responsibility it's like i you just feel so vulnerable because like a part of your intestine is exposed to like the outside world and um it was terrifying but i knew I had to do it. I just, I didn't feel like there was any other way that I was gonna uh, make it out. I had a three-step colectomy. So the first surgery, they created the, they took out the colon and um, created the ostomy, the stoma and the ostomy bag. And then the second surgery um, was three months later and they constructed the J pouch. There was like a broken file. I was using like an old editing software at this time. Um, I'm pretty sure it was a picture of a stoma, which um, you probably don't want to see anyway, so it's fine. 
three months after that, I had the reversal surgery where they got rid of the ostomy bag and reconnected um, my intestines to work. Um, so I'll go through that like briefly, just kind of what my emotional state was at the time, as much as I can remember. Cause like, as I said, it was, there's been a lot that's happened since then, which I'll get into living with a stoma was really difficult. Um, at first it was amazing. Uh, you had, you get your life back because I was logging nine hours a day on the toilet and you, you can't be, you can't hang out with people when you're on the toilet. You can't be doing work when you're on the, like, that's just the purest waste of time and alone time. And I didn't even realize how much of my time I was spending like that. Um, until like I went to the hospital and they made me log it. I was like, no. So I got all that time back. Like, it was really funny at first. So I'm just like, I'm shitting right now. Like, I don't have to run to the toilet every two seconds. Like, I will say, I also like sometimes <laughs> fantasize about my ostomy and I kind of miss it at times. I really do um, because of that reason exactly. Like, it's so convenient when you have to poop all the time. It is so convenient to be able to poop wherever you are. <laughs> you don't have to be on the toilet to poop. Like it was, it was such a relief, you know? Um, obviously it had its own issues, but that is something I tr try to remind myself of when, um, you know, I'm in a bad flare up with my J pouch now because it is, I do always have the option to go back to an ostomy bag. And at first that really scared me. And sometimes it does still scare me. But in general, these days, I find a lot of comfort in that thought. Because even if like worst case scenario, my J pouch like ruptures or, you know, life within my J pouch becomes exactly like it was with colitis, um, which is a thing like, Without a colon, you can't get colitis, but you can get pouchitis, which is colitis in your J pouch. You just can't have colitis because you don't have a colon, but you can still get the same inflammation and same symptoms in your J pouch, which is not something I really knew at the time. I mean, I'm sure I like they told me, but like, you know, I was on fucking fucked up. I was in the hospital, just like. When you're in that much pain, it's like you don't, you just kind of black out, you know? So, yeah, anyway, let's keep going. It was such a relief for the, on that end of things. Um, cause I just got my, my life back. Yeah, but I had a lot of complications with skin issues. So, like, the bag would start to like leak onto my skin, or the output would start to leak onto my skin, and then it, since it's like not broken down, it starts to like erode at your skin and I'd get like, it just hurt, it was so painful. It was like, it stung, it was bleeding and there's all, the, all these products to like put on it to check, try to help it and stop it, but it was just a pain. And I woke up multiple times in the middle of the night covered in my own shit because I would inevitably eat too close to bedtime and probably get like super high or something and then just wake up and I'm just covered in shit because the bag would explode because I don't miss that at all. <laughs> I remember one time when that happened, I had had pad thai that night and the shit that I woke up covered in just smelled so much like pad thai, but like the shit version of pad thai because when you have an ostomy bag, like it's less digested than when like a normal person would poop out what they just ate. It's way closer to how it was when you swallowed it. My sister was there too, and me and my sister couldn't really think or have pad thai for a bunch of years after that. Um, yeah, I don't miss that at all. A lot of times it wasn't even like there was that much shit in the bag. It was like, it was gassy, so it was filling up with air. So a lot of times I remember like just opening because I would have like the two part ostomy bag so I just like open the top of it and just let the air out to like see how much is actually in there and it would smell so fucking bad and I just felt like the most disgusting person on, on the planet so I found myself just numbing everything as much as possible I was getting really fucked up 
I was going out, like nobody knew I had an ostomy bag because that was like right when like mom jeans came into style and like the pleats at the top. So I was just wearing high-waisted jeans and like the baby crop tops and like nobody had a clue. And I was just getting as fucked up as possible. And that was my way of dealing with it, which um, I don't recommend. I reckon, I think the, the quicker that you can calm down about it and just look what's look what life handed you and deal with it, the better off you are. But I definitely got a lot out of my system because those are my college years. And I was just really pissed off that I was missing that. And I, I wanted to party. I wanted to do all the things normal people do. I was basically like rage partying. Like I was so... I was so angry. I was so angry and bitter that like everyone from my high school was like out and living their life and, you know, uh, just having their freshman year college experience. And I was fucking stuck in the hospital and then had a sh shit bag strapped to me. Like, but I was, you know, in New York City and that was fun. And I just like wanted to make the absolute most of it. And like, so like to the outside eye, like they wouldn't even know, you know, I was like, I'm just gonna fucking do this. I'm gonna be a New York socialite and go to every party I can find and just have fun. And I did, you know, I had a lot of fun. It was a great time and I'm glad that I was able to experience it. So, um, oh, so what I was going to say is like, I was really rage partying because I was just so bitter and angry that, uh, I was in the situation I was in. And so I have a lot of empathy for people who were seniors during, uh, COVID, or like, you know, if you were anywhere near like, cause I was just trying, I'm trying to, like, I thought of it the other day. I'm like, <laughs> just like having that like freedom. You're like, I'm free, I'm out. I'm, you know, like it's right here. And then having it be totally strapped, like taken from you and be like, nope, sorry. I'm gonna have to wait. You're gonna have to wait a while. Like that's, I had my own version of that um, when I graduated high school because I moved to New York when I was still 17. It was like like the second, I think I only stayed like a week after graduating my senior year and then moved straight to New York and partied that entire summer. <laughs> and it felt like a year there, but it was only like a few months before my surgeries. But I just did shit every single day. I had my own version of that where like I was off, I was in New York. I was like, oh yeah, I'm independent. Look at me living in New York by myself. Like something I've always wanted to do my whole life. And having that freedom and then being stuck in the hospital for a full month and then having an ostomy bag, having that for six months, just like still recovering and then having two more surgeries after that, like I'll explain. But it was my own kind of version of that like COVID hell that I'm sure a lot of you guys experienced, which it sucks, <laughs> it sucks. So I did, you know, I I don't think if you if you are that age and uh, have a have a ostomy bag. Don't let it stop you from doing anything you want to do. And that's I don't I don't regret what I did with my ostomy bag because it was fun and it distracted me. It, the six Easy. months flew by, and before I knew it, I didn't have an ostomy anymore. So when I had the final surgery, the recovery from that was probably the worst because of the fucking diaper rash, like. I don't, did I, I don't remember if I uh, went over the second surgery in this, did I? I mean, I should be able to tell you because I was just watching it. Um, I don't think I explained the second surgery that much here because it, there's really not much to explain. So the first surgery was removing your colon and giving you the ostomy bag. So, um, oh, I didn't want to explain it because I was like, I'm, I'm going to assume that you guys already know all this stuff. But the first surgery was to remove the colon, have the ostomy bag. Second surgery was to simply construct the J pouch. So there was nothing that really changed about like my situation the second surgery, that was three months later. 
Um, they just constructed the J pouch, gave it, and then gave it three more months to like settle into my body. Um, and before the third surgery, which is the reversal, which is where they put the stoma back in, which is the stoma is the end of the small intestine. So they put that back in and connect it to your J pouch. So you get rid of the ostomy bag and have, you know, have like a working colon through the J pouch, which is just a smaller colon that's basically made out of your small intestine. Um, yeah. When you don't use your asshole for six months and then you start using it again, you don't want to know what that feels like. And if you do, I'm sorry you had to feel that. Stock up on camelceptine. That stuff saved my life. It's like a lidocaine like uh, ointment. And uh, get a bidet and just, just pray. I stayed home for so... I didn't do anything after that surgery for months. I just stayed home and I don't even remember what I did. But um, that was... It was very painful. And honestly, I still get pretty bad diaper rash just because you don't have a colon to break down everything. So I had to stop recording for a therapy appointment and then um, I came back and recorded the rest of this and none of it ended up recording. So my first experience with that, my sister just said, just do it again. It's going to happen. So um, this stuff is like kind of difficult to talk about. So then I took a break for the day, gathered my thoughts, and I feel like I handled that really well, <laughs> at least on camera. Um, that I remember when that happened. That honestly hasn't happened to me as much as I thought it was going to since this was my first day recording and it happened. I was like, is this going to happen a lot where like I'm just going to record what I think is a whole video and then look and it's not recording? And my sister was like, yeah, that honestly just kind of happens sometimes. And it sucks, but you just have to, you know, keep going. And I was like, damn, all right, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's what's going to happen. Um, but no, that doesn't really happen. I guess now because I record like directly on my computer and like into Final Cut. I'm like, like if I can imagine if you're doing it with a actual camera. Um, it's hard to like see the viewfinder and all that to like know if you're recording or not but um yeah I remember that being super upsetting <laughs> and being like oh my god like the universe doesn't want me to record YouTube videos <laughs> like some stupid shit like that but I'm very proud of myself for just getting back into it record the rest of this so it gets pretty heavy so but I'm determined I'm gonna get it done so from 2015 to 2017, for the most part, like compared to the rest of my life, I was relatively healthy. Um, I was kind of focusing, well, I was healing from those initial three surgeries, uh, getting used to my J pouch. I was on and off different medicines. I think I was, I was on methotrexate for a lot of that, which I hated. Um, it's, it's like a, it's like the lowest grade of chemo you can get. And it's, um, it would always give, make me sick the next day. It's like a syringe you have to fill up on your own, which always like stressed me out. And it's a once a week shot in your leg. So I wasn't a fan of that. Finally got off of that and I started Humira. And then um, I just decided I really didn't want to be on anything. So I really tried hard to focus on yoga and eating healthy and to just see and try if I don't, if I can live without these heavy biologics. In April of 2018, I went on my yoga teacher training in Costa Rica. I was there for a month and no words will really ever do it justice. It was the most life-changing, most beautiful experience of my life. And I really think that everyone should do something like that go on some sort of retreat or just go to another country where you don't know anybody for an extended amount of time and just see what happens because it was terrifying, but I am so, so grateful that I did that. Um, and I try to carry that experience with me um, wherever I go. After I got back from Costa Rica, I came back to um, my apartment in Brooklyn and in a few months later, in June of 2018, I had my first uh, bowel obstruction or abdominal blockage, um, which is exactly what it sounds. Um, 
nothing passes through your system. And a lot of times it's from scar tissue from previous surgeries. I went to this hospital in Brooklyn that was close by because I was in excruciating pain and went to the ER and they put an NG tube in, which is like that vacuum tube they stick in your nose and you have to swallow it. And then it goes all the way down into your stomach and suctions things out of you. And it's in there for as long as it needs to be in there. My, that one was in there for over 24 hours, which I didn't know when they were putting it in. I, it was like the most uncomfortable thing. It feels like there's glass in your throat. I ended up staying there for about a week. Um, when I had the NG, NG tube in, they had to do a CAT scan to see what was going on. So for their precious CAT scans, they need to have their precious barium fluid uh, contrast to go in so they can see the images more clearly. So since I couldn't swallow anything, since I had a tube in my throat, um, they started feeding the barium into the tube that was in my nose and my intestines were blocked. So every, like if you picture my intestines is just blocked up all like this, nothing could pass through. So I don't know why they thought that putting a bunch of liquid into my tube would mean that that would pass through. Nothing else is passing through. So they feed it into it. And I just remember during that CAT scan, it was one of the most painful things. And I, they were giving me morphine. I was screaming and it just, nothing was helping. And I just had a feeling something went wrong, but it was over. Um, life went on. I continued to uh, recover from that. They took out the tube, whatever, everything was fine. They sent me home from the hospital. And then I continued to live the next few months of that summer um, with barium in the lining of my abdomen and in my lungs. So when they were feeding the barium into my clogged intestines, um, a hole burst because obviously they were clogged. It acts like a kink toes. So there's no nowhere for it to go so a hole formed in my small intestine and then the barium fluid leaked out into the, my abdomen wall and my lungs and i only really knew something was wrong when i i uh, was starting to have trouble breathing i've never had problems breathing and then i had a really sharp pain like underneath my rib and i it was it was just very strange feeling i was like i think i should go to the hospital so i finally go back and they're like, how have you been living um, for these past few months? Like there's barium in your body. And um, then I had another surgery to um, remove the barium and clean up the scar tissue. And then I had a catheter put in my lungs to remove the barium fluid from my lungs, which is like, don't ever get a catheter put in your lungs. I'm just gonna leave it there like it's in your back and they like drain it for five minutes and it is not fun at all I didn't like really go into it there because I was traumatized <laughs> but um when I got the catheter put in my lungs um I was like shaking crying because it hurts so bad so like they put it in like here like beneath like in between your ribs basically like into your lungs and um I, it hurts so bad. They only like locally numbed the area, but I could still feel like everything. And when I was crying, you don't realize how much your back moves when you cry. And I was like, <laughs> and every time I cried, it would move and then it would hurt more. So then I would cry more and then I would move and then it would hurt more and then I would cry. It was just like five minutes of hell. It felt like three hours. Don't recommend, zero out of 10. <laughs> at all. It was really hard to do. Anyway, so I, uh, that was in September of 2018. After all that happened, I was pretty traumatized and didn't really feel like hustling in New York anymore. I just wanted to go home, hang out with my dog, hang out with my parents. I was just kind of over it. So my boyfriend and I decided to move back um, into the house I grew up in in Massachusetts and which is where I am right now. I'm not in the apartment I grew up in. Um, I live in a two family house and we've always rented out the first floor. So when I came back here in 2019, uh, I was living on the third floor 
And then my grandparents were living in this apartment and both of them have since passed, rest in peace. Um, but the timing worked out really perfectly when after, after filming this, when I went through the breakup and decided to move back home, um, this apartment became available. So this is where I've been living. It's phenomenal. Spend a year there just trying to like relax and figure our shit out, just figure out what we want to do. And I spent that year mostly healing, doing a lot of yoga. I was teaching a lot. I started posting videos on YouTube and just trying to get back on my feet, basically. I wanted to move back to New York and we knew that. We just wanted a break. We got our... So, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it in my voice. Um, she was stuck in a bad relationship, but she did not want to move back to New York. <laughs> I just knew that my ex wanted to and he was not going to be happy unless we were living there and I did not know how to break up with him. <laughs> Simple as that. I was just like, oh, okay, well, I'll go to New York back. Yes. I mean, I did want to go back. Like, New York is like, honestly, New York is like being in a toxic relationship in itself. <laughs> like, it just like always... I don't know. I, I had a, there's a lot of like inherent FOMO that comes with living in New York and then not being in New York and all the things that you're missing or even on the nights that you're out being like, oh, well, there's this other party happening over there. It's just like, it's so much. It's so loud. It's so like in every sense of the word, it's loud, like sound wise, of course, but also just like energy wise it's just like there's so much just being at you all the time and my nervous system for years before I actually left because I lived there for six years um for years my nervous system was yelling at me to get out of there and I just I just wanted to stay <laughs> I just wanted to stay I just wanted to make it work um but yeah apartment in Brooklyn uh January 2020 and I was going to Costa Rica to help teach on the yoga teacher training that I was a student on once. They wanted me back as a teacher. So I went back to Costa Rica in February of 2020. Spent the month there. It was a beautiful experience. I met so many amazing people. But my health did not feel right when I was there. I felt incredibly dehydrated. It was the dry season. I don't have a colon. I felt like I could not drink enough water. There was no air conditioning. I was just sweating 24 seven for like a month. And then by the last week I had to go to urgent care and get an IV drip and the guy made my arm bleed. And it was just this whole like ordeal. It was really scary also, cause I was in an unfamiliar country, um, just unfamiliar doctors who didn't speak English and my Spanish isn't the best. So it was, it was just all pretty uncomfortable. So I was, I was actually excited to go home and it was, it was kind of a bummer because the last time I was in Costa Rica it was the healthiest I've ever felt so I was just fully expecting to get like a health boost from being there but it really was kind of the opposite it was pretty draining so I get back first week of March and then I spent that week going to see modeling agencies and looking for jobs around the city and just trying to like kickstart my life back in New York and hopefully get signed and do all that stuff so then on March 10th in 2020, I started to have blockage symptoms, a lot of belly pain, same thing, go back to Mount Sinai uptown. And then my surgeon comes down and he says that um, what it looks like from the imaging is that the organs like aren't in the right places and he hasn't really seen it before. And he needs to, he's only like read about stuff like that. So he needs to go in and check it out. I remember that it was like in the middle of the night, middle of the morning, it was like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. around that time. And I just remember my surgeon looking like pissed off, like he had just had to come in, like you could tell he wasn't planning on coming in. And he ha has like a thick Russian accent too, but he was like, which I'm not gonna attempt at, <laughs> but he was just like, hey, so you know, I've never seen this on a patient before. I have read about it before, but we're just gonna have to open you up and see what's going on. And I was like, well, thanks for saying that. Thanks for letting me know. It makes me feel confident and safe. <laughs> and that's really not what you want to hear when you're about to be in surgery, is that your surgeon has never 
seen it before. What, what are you going to do? I, uh, I went into the surgery, woke up to the news that my organs had twisted around each other. And they have no idea how it happened. They have no idea what causes it, no idea how to prevent it. Just, it was all just question marks. And I still don't have answers for any of that. So it's all just pretty unsettling because I'm like, did I do something wrong? Am I going to keep doing something wrong? Is that going to happen again? Like, it's just so many unknowns, which is like, welcome to living life with chronic illnesses. Like, just nobody knows. It's, it's Everything is just, oh, we don't know, but it should be okay. And I'm just like, this is my life here, you know? This is one of the big reasons why I'm making these videos now is because it's so hard to get people to understand you. And the only way I feel understood is by talking to people who actually understand and who've been through this or have been with me going through this even though they like my family and um, my friends even though they don't fully understand like they've seen me and like they see how I react to things and they know me so um, I feel like understood by them but not on a level of like you've been through it too. This is why the internet is fantastic. So if you're familiar with the COVID timeline in New York, March 10th, um, not the best time to be in the hospital. Uh, this whole shitty, the whole shitty, yep, Freudian slip, the whole city shut down on March 13th. So usually after a surgery, I end up staying in the hospital for at least five days, like minimum. It's usually more like a week. This time they kicked me out on the 13th. So my surgery was on the 10th and they kicked me out three days after. And they were like, if you can have oral pain meds, like go. And it was a little bit confusing. Like there was rumors about COVID, but they didn't come out and straight up say that. And then right when I get home from the hospital, like I'm watching the news and like everything shut down, like quarantine starts, like boom. So I was dealing with that anxiety of like, oh my God, I was just in the hospital and had surgery. And what if I got COVID, all that stuff. But I was good, no worries. And then I went home. I've still never gotten COVID. Just saying. Home and spent the following two months with my parents, um, just healing, recovering, quarantining. That's where I hatched my idea for the Patreon page and expanding that stuff. So, so I'm really just looking for a job that I can do through all of this bullshit, you know, because um, it's really, really exhausting to be working a regular job and just having to like quit for months at a time or just like, you know, just be gone when something like this comes up, which is inevitable with this chronic hell that um, some people have to live in. So I'm just trying to work with it the best I can and trying to do stuff from home which is just kind of against my nature because I really want to be out there in the world and do customer service. Like I'm a waitress, I'm a barista, I'm a teacher. Like I want to be talking to people. So I guess in this virtual world, I can do a lot of that stuff from home. I mean, obviously not customer service, but maybe like a call center or something if anyone has ideas. So I'm not sure exactly how much I'm going to end up putting in like I keep thinking like okay I'm gonna react to the whole like just play the whole video but I also want to like encourage you guys to go watch that original video um in its entirety so I might just do clips here and there because some of it just isn't relevant anymore like this part <laughs> where I'm talking about um I might play it or I might cut it out but I mentioned that I really want a job that I can do from home um because at this time I had just had to quit the job I was working at because I had just had an unexpected surgery and ended up being in the hospital and ended up having to recover for a few months. So I couldn't like be standing on my feet as a barista all day, every day. Um, and I was, that was like my final blow at that where I was like, okay, I'm so sick of this. Cause I have worked, I've probably worked over 30 jobs in my life. I've been working since I was 14 though. So, I mean, yeah, I've, I'm sure I've worked at over 30 places. <laughs> like I've, you know, my first, I was ice cream scooper, waitressing, barista, um, front desk at gyms, uh, yoga teacher, med like I've, I've worked at so many different establishments. And the cycle that I was continually living through was work a job, get sick, have to quit the job because I can't go to work and all of like the 
the nature of the work I was doing was like, you know, high turnover anyway. So they're like, I'm not going to save my waitressing position for me if I'm going to be gone for three months. Um, and it was also just kind of like bad vibes on my end where I'm like, I want a fresh new start when I recover. So I would just, I would find a job, work that job, get sick, have to quit. And then not only was I recovering from surgery, I was also stressed out because I'm like, I don't have a job. <laughs> like I need, I need a job. So then I'd have to be not only recovering from surgery, but also on a job hunt, which fucking sucked. So that's why at this time in my life, like when I was recording this video, I was trying to set up an online presence on YouTube and Insight Timer and trying to get like passive income through there. But you know, I, um, I totally forgot about this stuff. This is the best setting spray. Even though I don't really need it right now, I'm not going anywhere, but, um, but yeah, what was I saying? Sorry, I just got so distracted. <laughs> um, but, oh yeah. So at this, at the time of me filming this video, I was like doing my best to I was like, I'll be like, cause I never wanted to be like an influencer, but I'm just like, I need to make money online somehow. Like how awesome would it be if, um, next time I ended up in surgery, like I didn't have to quit a job. <laughs> what if I, what if I could just worst case scenario, be working from my hospital bed. So in this video, I'm like asking people for ideas and like, um, if you know anyone who like needs a work from home employee, like what should I even do? Blah, blah, blah. Um, the timing was very synchronistic around the time I was deciding I was going to move away from New York and move back home to Massachusetts. My sister was pregnant with her first baby and the job that she was working was a video editor for this company that makes a lot of wedding highlight films. And she realized that she didn't want to do that job anymore and she needed to find or she wanted to find like a replacement so she wasn't just like leaving the company and just having them have to search for an editor and the timing was so perfect where i was like that is exactly what i want to do like i've always edited videos i've you know i even like my parents camcorder when i was growing up you know like i would edit together little films here and there so i'm like this is so perfect so i went down to maryland for um a week and she trained me and then I came back up here and got to work and this, this is the job I've been doing ever since. So I've been doing it for like three years now and it's amazing and I'm really good at it if I do say so myself. Like I get so much satisfaction out of creating like a family heirloom, hopefully, <laughs> if you ignore the divorce rate. But I feel like I can tell. I mean, it's probably a little bit delusional, but like I, you know, come up with all these like stories in my head about this couple and like then when you listen to the speeches, you actually like learn a lot about the couple and then you, like put together like exact like just their dream video that encapsulates their day and like it just just knowing that like I'm creating something that will be cherished by these people, by their family, by their kids one day, like something that people will re like it's it's a very it feels sacred to me and I love it so freaking much. And I just got like a sort of promotion. So I'm going to be doing like more high end wedding videos now, which I'm really excited about so I can spend longer on them rather than like the budget ones where like I would want to spend like 30 hours doing it, but like financially that d didn't make sense to do so. So I'd have to like rush through them. So anyway, all that to say, I no longer am looking for a job. I am employed and very happy. <laughs> And that's why, you know, I don't make as much YouTube content as I was probably planning to at this stage of my life um, or at this at the stage when I was first recording this three years ago. I think my plan was like, I'm going to become a YouTuber and just like YouTube, like have that be my job, you know, be a professional YouTuber. And um, that's not really what I mean, that's obviously not where I ended up. And it's honestly not even what I want anymore. Like I want to put videos on YouTube when I feel like talking, when I feel like sharing, when I feel like I have something that I want to say and I think other people might want to hear and leave it at that. <laughs> like, I don't want to, like I learned my lesson with teaching yoga where 
it is really difficult to do the thing you love as your full-time job because it really like strips that it strips like the the carefree the love the like spiritual aspect of it for me like, especially with yoga I was once at one point in my life was teaching 10 classes a week and it really hindered my own personal practice which is everything to me it is the reason I am alive it is the reason I am who I am um, is because of you know the spiritual practice I have with myself that is a daily practice and when I'm constantly, whenever I'm doing that practice, if I'm always sharing it with other people, it's no longer a private, personal thing. And I'm someone who is very prone to perform. And like, uh, I, I think I'm just kind of like a natural people pleaser in a way. I'm a natural performer in that way, where like, if I know people are watching me, even, if, even when I know people aren't watching me, I'm performing to some extent. And I love it. It's just kind of the way that, I am mannerisms wise and just like, I don't know, at spirit wise, that is how I am. And so, I mean, I grew up modeling and that's a performance in itself as well. So all the things I love to do, like teaching, modeling, making YouTube videos, all, everything I love to do is performing besides video editing. And so I really am just so happy I was able to have this job where I'm fully like I'm comfortable I'm supporting myself fully and creating things that I love for people to also love and then in my free time doing YouTube because I, I could already tell like if when I once I started to look at YouTube like okay I have to record a video this week because I need to have weekly uploads if I want to grow my channel and blah 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 like it made it it wasn't fun anymore <laughs> or like if i'm if i'm recording when i feel like i have to record because i have to get a video up it's like it's not fun and then why the fuck am i doing it you know like the reason i love doing everything that i do online is because it's fun and because it connects me with other people who you know are like-minded or have brand new ideas for me like it's it's a beautiful thing to be a part of youtube in general social media in general but if you're too involved in it and too wrapped up in it, if it's your full time, if it's how you're supporting yourself, like it just, at least for me, did not feel like a healthy path for me to go down. So I'm very happy. All of that to say, I'm very happy with where I'm at right now with my job and with my relationship with YouTube and social media. And I actually do have a video I'm writing right now about, um, your relationship with social media. Anyway, I'm almost done with this. Okay, let's let's finish this video. So after about two months of staying back home with my family, I decided to come back to New York and finish my recovery and quarantine here in Brooklyn. And almost exactly six months after the surgery I had in March, on September 5th, 2020, I got blockage symptoms again. I tried to do everything in my power to stop it. I did all the torso twists, took all the laxatives, all the crystals, all the massaging, and was so determined to try to stop it on my own. And I failed. I was throwing up. By the end of it, I probably threw up like over 30 times. I just, I couldn't stop. And my boyfriend and his mom drove me up to the hospital around midnight-ish and I was throwing up in the car, throwing up in the ER, didn't really stop for about six or seven hours. And it was just a completely hellish experience that I don't really want to relive by telling it. Um, you can imagine. I still don't feel like reliving it and telling that story again. Um, so I'm not going to. That was the closest I ever felt to death. Maybe one day I will really relive that because in the CPTSD therapy study I was a part of, they made me tell that story of when I almost died that time over and over and over again, record myself saying that story, listen to the recording. Like it was hell. I was like, this doesn't seem helpful. This doesn't feel helpful. And then when I just started saying the story, she would say like, no, you're saying it like you're watching it. Like bring your, put yourself back there. Like I had to like 
go back to that exact time when I almost died and tell the story over and over and over again because that was going to help me. I quit in the middle of the study because I was like, this is this feels dangerous, honestly. I mean, maybe for some people that helps, maybe for some situations that helps, but uh, not that one. Or maybe for some like people and just the way that their brains work, maybe because I think the idea was to like desensitize yourself to it, like with this traumatic story that keeps coming back up that like really bothers you. Um, if you just say it enough times, bring yourself back there enough times, like it desensitizes you to it, I think was the idea they were going for. But it didn't, I did not feel that effect and I gave it a real solid shot. I was doing that for like two months with this with this woman and it was like, they were doing like biometric stuff of like reading my heart rate, like as I tell the story and like, it was just, I came to the conclusion, I'm like, I feel like shit leading up to this appointment, like shit during it and like shit afterwards. Like there's no positive benefits I had from that type of practice whatsoever. Like it happened. I don't need to be reliving it every single day. <laughs> like it's fine. Just let it be in the past. Then around 7 a.m. my surgeon came to see me and just said that things weren't looking good in the images and he couldn't really tell clearly. So he just wanted to get inside and see what was going on. And I was just like, whatever you have to do, I trust this man with my life. I have trusted him with my life multiple times at this point. Um, so I just said whatever he had to do to get me out of this pain, please just make it stop. Cause it was, there was nothing that was helping the pain whatsoever. Um, so going to surgery, I wake up in the PACU and felt my belly because there's always that chance that I'd wake up with an ostomy bag. And I felt my belly and felt this new pretty scar that I got. Healing update. This long one down my belly. This is the new one. I have one about the same size along my bikini line from my first surgery. This right here is where my stoma was. This is all the laparocytes from yeah, the laser surgeries. And yeah, the discoloration is mostly, I think, from a heating pad. I almost always Still have a do. heating pad on my stomach. Um, Hi, but it could also be from like internal bruising. Like I, I have no idea what it's from. So that's just the way I am. I think it's on the heating pad though. <laughs> um, it was from the heating pad. It still is from the heating pad. It's been about a week in the hospital after that surgery to be like monitored and all that. I go home, um, start slowly introducing foods back, having broth and rice and chicken and just really gentle things that are usually okay with me, like eggs, all that stuff. And then the day before I went in for my post-op, I started having blockage symptoms again and it was awful, I was in a ton of pain. And this time I just took a ton of laxatives and just prayed that it would pass because my appointment was the next day. So I just thought if I can make it to my appointment, I'll be good. So I, around four o'clock, I started to get some relief from the blockage symptoms and was like, phew, uh, went to my post-op the next day and told him what had happened. And he looked pretty concerned um, and explained to me that he left that damaged part of the small intestine in my stomach. So there's always a chance that that doesn't recover and he'll end up having to take it out anyway. So for the following two weeks, he ordered me to just have baby food and insure drinks to get my vitamins. Like you gotta get your weight up and gotta get the right vitamins in you so that you can hopefully heal properly. Uh, Cause I hadn't been able to tolerate enough food to heal. So that was two weeks ago from tomorrow. So tomorrow is I'm going to see him again and we'll talk about whether I need to have another surgery this week or next week. So that's really why I wanted to make this video now is to kind of catch up um, on my health history. So that way in the future, if there is any more surgeries, I'll be able to document them as they're happening and kind of reach out for that help and support in the moment of it. So what'd you guys think? <laughs> There was 24-year-old Ruthie. There was her first ever time talking to the camera in a YouTube video. And here's Essie. And 
Oh, and here's Molly, too. Jump up, Molly. Let's show everyone how cute we all are. Let's show everyone how cute we are, us three girls. <laughs> Molly, come here. She said, no, I'm just gonna lay here. Yeah, as she said, I don't know, I'm gonna ferociously bite your fingers off. Oh, no! Here's Molly. Okay, so that was that on that. Like I said, you can go back and watch that video in its entirety. Um, if you go to my Ruthie Rambles playlist, it is the first video in that playlist. And you can actually, if you're interested, if you wanna like get caught up with my life up to where I'm at right now through YouTube videos, which I love doing with creators. So maybe you want to with me too. Um, you can go back and just watch that whole Ruthie Rambles playlist in its entirety. And I'm pretty sure all of the talking videos are there, but there might be some that are not in that playlist that are, are in health history and updates, but I'm pretty sure all the talking videos are in the Ruthie Rambles playlist, but I will double check. Um, spoiler alert if you did want to go do that, because um, I did not end up having another surgery after that appointment. And actually, I haven't had a surgery since I started recording these YouTube videos, which is so funny to me because the urgency I felt in creating this video was that first video was that I thought I was gonna have another surgery soon and I wanted to like document that so I didn't wouldn't feel like you know I'm going through it alone or like like so I could you know show other people um, what that's like and I wouldn't have to like explain everything that I've already been through while I'm currently going through something else um, and it's just so funny because I haven't had a surgery since since I started doing talking videos so that's good <laughs> um, but just because I haven't had a surgery since then um, my health has not been great the past three years and if you're more interested in just my health stuff uh, if you go to the health history and updates playlist and watch that all the way through um, like first video to most recent video that will that should catch you up on basically everything <laughs> that I've dealt with in the past three years and before. Um, yeah, it is It is all out there. <laughs> it's like, it's something I kind of forget about because I don't rewatch my videos. Once I edit and post a video, like I don't watch it again. I don't even like think about it again. So it's uh, really interesting for me to go back and watch these old videos of mine. Cause I think, I don't know if it was in this video. I think I say it a few times in videos, but I remember saying that I'm making these videos, I'm like writing these scripts and making these videos with the intention of what did my past self need to hear? Like 14 year old Ruthie just diagnosed, what things could I tell that girl or a girl in that position, a person in that position? What things can I tell a person in that position, the positions that I've been in in my past? And writing everything and speaking everything with that intention, like this is for my past self. And what I realized when I was watching this video for the first time yesterday, when I kind of like pre-screened the video to make sure I even wanted to do this, um, I realized that, you know, I think I was making these videos for my future self. I think past Ruthie, who loved saying, do the things your future self will thank you for, and I still love saying that, it's one of my favorite quotes, it's, a really helpful reminder for me like just for small things like with putting my dirty clothes directly in the hamper rather than on the floor because it saves you having to take it from the floor and put it in the hamper later like future Ruthie will be pleased that it's in the hamper as it is or just like simple things like that but for bigger things as well and what I don't think I realized at the time of filming any of the videos I filmed is that they're gonna really help out my future self because a lot of the things that I have said in my past videos that I watched for the first time yesterday um, felt like exactly what I needed to hear and they felt like reminders that I've forgotten. <laughs> and, you know, obviously there's a lot of cringy things and like I don't fully agree with everything that I said <laughs> and I have grown a shit ton since I first started making videos. Um, 
but I, there was also a lot of wisdom there. Just a lot of things that I kind of forgot about and it just really warms my heart <laughs> that, um, you know, a lot of the things I've created in the past, I created with the intention of helping my past self but they were actually helping my future self. And I think that's still what's happening now. And, you know, maybe a 30 year old Ruthie, when she revisits this video again, will gain even more insights from her past self. And it's fun to think about where it's like, I have no idea. I feel like I've lived like six lives since filming that like three years ago. So who knows where I will be in three years, but I'm excited to find out. But not too excited. I'm going to enjoy the journey. I'm going to take my time. But I think that's all I got for you. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thanks for going on this journey with me, this trip down memory lane. I will link the original video in the description. So if you want to go watch the full one in its entirety, you may go ahead and do so. And yeah. And you don't need to do the like and comment and subscribe and notification bell things. You can do whatever you want, but it would be really, really nice if you did that because then it would help me. It would grow my channel a little bit more. I don't know. I'm thinking about like 900 subscribers. So let's get to a thousand. That would be cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. like a little worry stone I have. Fun. Oh, I love it. Hello.